I want you to picture this scenario. Have you ever had a scenario like this where you were having a conversation with someone about any number of issues? Maybe it was whether we're in a mid-cycle financial or late cycle. Maybe it was whether there would be war in Ukraine or Russia. Whatever it is, you're having a conversation with someone and you are perfectly well prepared to advance your position. You know exactly what to say. All of the facts are on your side. You're feeling confident and not only that, but Whenever they have a counter-argument, you have the perfect response. You know that all, everything's on your side, that everyone should believe you. What you are saying is clearly correct. And yet, you look across at your conversation partner, and what you see is this. <laughs> Why is it that so often we get this reaction when all the facts are on your side? And I assure you, you're not alone. Let me tell you the story of Ignis Semmelweis. Some of you may already know, being in the biosciences, but in the 1800s, he was the first to discover that hand washing can prevent the spread of germ disease. It was under rather tragic uh, circumstances. In his hospitals, he noticed a disturbing trend. Women in the maternity ward who saw doctors were dying at a significantly higher rate than women who saw midwives in the maternity ward. The data was undeniable, but he didn't know the reason. But then another tragedy occurred that, that helped him to figure out why. His friend was working with a medical student while they were doing an autopsy, and the medical student accidentally stabbed the friend with a scalpel that had just touched a cadaver. The friend developed an infection and died of it. Simmelweis himself was responsible for doing the autopsy on his own friend, and he noticed something. He noticed that the infection that his friend died of was remarkably similar to the infection that the women were dying of on the maternity ward after seeing doctors. He then realized, wait a second, a bunch of our doctors are coming straight from the morgue to see these women. And so he developed a simple solution. He created a chlorinated lime solution and just asked doctors, just rub your hands in this just for a few minutes before you see the women. And sure enough, it worked. The data was compelling. So this is what it looked like. Uh, are these advancing? Oh, sorry, there it goes, it's on that side, sorry, I was looking at the wrong side. The data was compelling, so you can see before the intervention and after the intervention where the arrow is. Before, women who saw doctors were dying at a much higher rate, and then afterwards, the rate became the same and even got lower once you saw a doctor. Women were dying at a much lower rate. You would think that the world would rejoice in such a finding. You would think that they would all be excited because after all, it works, it saves lives, and what's more, it's simple, it takes only a few minutes of your time, and it's cheap, just a few dollars, and you are literally saving lives. You would think that the world would rejoice in such a finding, but nobody believed him. Not only did they say, we don't believe you, they also said, you're crazy, and they threw him in a mental asylum. Why is this? Why is it that so often when the facts are on the sides, we're met, facts are on our side, we're met with resistance? Let me tell you the parable of the scale. I'm currently on a weight loss journey myself. I've lost about 30 pounds. Admittedly, I did recently fall off the wagon if my shirt looks a little bit tight this morning, that's why. But I have lost about 30 pounds so far. Every morning I start my morning the same way. I get up, I get on the scale, and I look at the number that it gives to me. If I get a number that I like, if it's the same as the previous day or my weight goes down, I don't think anything of it. I jump in the shower and I begin my day. What if I get a number I don't like, though? What if the number goes up on the scale from the previous day? Well, then I start shifting my weight around. I move the scale to another location. I try to find any possible reason why the scale got it wrong. And this is how we deal with facts in general. When you get facts that you like, you're like, yep, sounds good, let's do it, perfect recommendation, let's move forward. But when you get facts that are inconvenient, facts that you don't like, that aren't on your side, you dig in your heels, you start scrutinizing the source, what might your biases be, what was your methodology, where are the flaws in your thought process, you try to figure out how exactly you can find the weak point that will, dice, that will completely get rid of the entire argument and allow you to dismiss it. So, what can we do? What if I told you that there was a better solution? What if I told you that there is a way that you can get people to hear your ideas, to remember your ideas, and to adopt your ideas that doesn't involve our traditional way of just presenting facts? Storytelling is a way to make your ideas not only more memorable, but also more persuasive. 
your ideas can become 12 and a half times more memorable. So this is research that came from Chip Heath out of the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. And he would have his students give a speech, just one minute long. Half of the students were asked to give a talk on why nonviolent crime is a serious issue in America right now. The other half were asked to do the exact opposite, to explain, oh, it's not so bad right now. In the average speech, only one minute long, the typical student introduced about two and a half statistics but only one out of 10 students incorporated a story. Heath would then have a buffer exercise. He'd have them watch a Monty Python clip for 10 minutes just to, just, just to distract them for a moment. And then afterwards ask them, write down as many things as you can remember from everybody's speech. The class collectively was in amazement. They were astonished by how much they could not remember of speeches that happened even just 10 minutes sooner. When it came to statistics, only 5% of the statistics were recalled 10 minutes later. But when it came to stories, 63% of them were remembered 10 minutes later. Not only are they more memorable, but they also are more persuasive. So this was done by the LGBT Center of Los Angeles, and they had canvassers going door to door, and they were trying to get people to be convinced that they should add transgendered people to the list of categories of people who are protected by anti-discrimination bills. So they were just going around house to house. Now, what is deep canvassing? It's a method that was developed by political scientists at both UC Berkeley and Stanford University. And it basically involves you going around and listening to the other person, asking what matters to them, and then telling relevant stories from your own experience. Not getting in an argument, not presenting facts, just telling them stories about, in this case, transgender people who you know and how they might face discrimination. There's a YouTube video, which I have a screenshot of right here. You can find this if you want to from the LGBT Center of Los Angeles, but it is breathtaking to watch the deep canvassing method in action. You see this woman who was initially skeptical who says, well, you know, what if a, a predator goes into the opposite gender back room? What are we gonna do in that situation? And over time, as he tells stories of his own friends who are transgendered, who have experienced discrimination, you see her changing her mind. You can see the wheels in motion until at the very end she says, yeah, they should be protected by anti-discrimination laws. It's just the right thing to do. It's incredible seeing it in action. Regardless of what side you believe in, regardless of any of that, it's incredible to see how people can be motivated by hearing stories of other people. In fact, compared to traditional canvassing methods, which largely involve reading a script, you say that, I respond this, you say that, I give you this fact, as compared to traditional canvassing method, deep canvassing has proven to be 102 times more likely to persuade another person compared to traditional canvassing. So, how do you do this? How do you create stories that are compelling? Let me give you your vehicle for storytelling, and all you need to remember is the word CAR, and it is an acronym that stands for Context Action Result. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was in high school, my English teacher told me that a story has so many parts. There's the setting, the context, the rising action, the turning point, the climax, the denouement, and then the resolution. Oh, that's a lot. <laughs> this is a little bit simpler. Let's simplify it to just three parts, which is context, action, result, which is what you want in every single story you tell. The context is basically the who, what, when, where, why of the story. Who is the hero in our story? Who's the villain if there is one? When and where is the story set? What are our hero's motivations? What are their dreams? What do they want to achieve? All those kinds of questions. The action is, what did the hero do? What happened in the middle of this story? And then finally, the result is, what happened as a result of that action? What was the outcome? Did the hero get what she wanted? Did the villain get what he deserved? What happened as a result of undertaking this? So let's apply this to, let's say, uh, tech uh, pitches for investment pitches. We'll do investment pitches. So let's just apply this really quickly. We'll apply the framework to investment pitches. And it's remarkably simple. So what's the context in this? Well, it's what's going on in the market right now. What are other people doing right now? How does the market exist right now? What's being tried right now? The action is your startup. If we have funding, we can do all of these things that we want to do to spread our ideas to all of these wonderful consumers. And the result is all of your analysis. It tells you what are your revenue projections, all of that. What do you expect to happen if you get that investment? So you can wrap even these pitches, even highly technical pitches, inside, inside of stories that get people motivated to take action. 
A few considerations as you're crafting your story, and then I want to talk about specific strategies that you can do just to make your story a little bit spicier. But first, let's talk about a few just very broad recommendations. The first is that you should always consider who is your audience. What are their motivations? And here's the thing. Having a different audience means a completely different pitch, even if it's on the exact same subject matter. Let's say, for instance, that you are creating widgets, and now you need to pitch to investors. The wrong pitch might be, these widgets are highly enjoyable. No, that's, that's for consumers. Consumers care about how enjoyable. So you have the right pitch for the wrong audience. What do investors care about? Whether they're going to get their money back, right? <laughs> so, so you're going to talk about instead, these widgets are enjoyable. Millions of people right now are already enjoying my widgets and is producing these financial models. So consider who is your audience. Even if you have the exact same pitch, it depends on who you're presenting it to. You should be always adjusting your pitch depending on who the audience is. You can give the same pitch a million times, and it'll be a million different ways depending on who exactly the audience is. Second broad strategy before we get into some specific strategies on, on just making things a little bit spicier, but uh, is to consider how the brain work. So here, right here, this is a real-life image of your actual brain. Incredible, isn't it? Okay, this, of course, is a metaphor. It comes from the social psychologist Jonathan Haidt at New York University, if I recall correctly. And he describes that our brain is divided into two different parts. There's an elephant and a rider. The elephant is the emotional part of your brain. It springs into action readily, and it moves with a great deal of force when it moves. If you get that elephant moving, I don't know about you, I've had plenty of interactions with my spouse where I got heated in the moment, it seemed like the right thing to say at the time, and boy was it not, but that elephant sure moves quickly once it's motivated, isn't it? On the other hand, thankfully, we have a writer sitting on top of the elephant. And the writer is the logical part of your brain. It's pulling the reins, saying, no, elephant, don't say that to your boss. That's a bad idea. Let's think about this a little bit more. The elephant is fast. It comes to judgments quickly. It comes to ideas and conclusions quickly, whereas the writer is more methodical, deliberate, and slow in its decision making. Incidentally, I don't know about you, but I believed for a long time that feelings have no place when it comes to decision making, that it's a byproduct of evolution, that we should just you know, ignore them. They were great for animals, and they were even great for humans when we were trying to survive, but boy, do they get in the way now. Turns out I was wrong. In the early 90s, a, a neuroscientist by the name of Antonio Damasio found that, as it turns out, you make decisions based on emotions that are better decisions at times than when you sit down and think about them. And he studied people who had damage in their brains, such as one patient who he named in the literature, Elliot, not his real name, privacy, all that kind of stuff, but named in the literature, Elliot. Elliot was unable to feel anything. You give him provocative images that would say pornographic images or grotesquely violent images, something that would evoke an emotional response in all of our brains, put them in front of him, Nothing was there. MRI scans reveal that he wasn't feeling anything, no matter what you put in front of him. On the other hand, though, all of his cognitive abilities were totally intact. He was still able to, to think through things rationally and scored off the charts when it came to measures of his intelligence. So what happened when we had a real-life Mr. Spock? when we had someone who was totally rational and didn't allow feelings to get in the way? Did he make better decisions? Uh-uh, exact opposite. In fact, he was unable to make any decisions at all. You ask him a simple question like, where should we go for lunch today? He'd look at the restaurants, well, that one has a long line, so that means a long wait, which is bad, but that one over there doesn't have a line. But maybe no one likes the food over there, and that's why there's not a line. And then after weighing all of this, he'd say, I need to write all of this down. I need to write all of the pro and cons down. And then a new decision came. Should I use blue ink or black ink? And then he came up with an entire equivocation on that. At the end of all of that, he was unable to make any decisions at all. Our emotions actually do guide us towards what feels right. What is the correct decision here? Oftentimes, there isn't an objectively correct decision, and our feelings guide us towards what is right, but also what isn't right. I have a bad feeling right now when I'm with this group of people telling me these things, talking to me that way. That signals to you something about your team environment and what you need to be in a successful team environment. Anyway, I went on a little digression there, but both feelings and logic are responsible for rational decision making. And stories bring both of them all together in one fell swoop. 
You get an emotional feeling when you get swept into a story, but you also get the logic of what I should do, what's the takeaway, what's the moral of the story, as Aesop always included in his fables. So let's talk a little bit about how we can do both of these things. How do we motivate both the elephant and the writer? How are we going to energize that elephant so that way there's a lot of motivation to move forward with your idea? And then how do we rouse the writer so that the writer says, yes, that's a good idea. Elephant, move forward with all of your force. So how do we do both of these? And I'm just going to give you three very quick strategies for each one, starting with energizing the elephant. So three quick strategies on this. Strategy number one is what I call look to the one. This comes from a quote from Mother Teresa. And Mother Teresa commented, when I look to the masses, I'll never act. But if I look to the one, I will. When you're crafting your stories, I don't want broad statistical trends. I want you to tell the story of one single individual or one single uh, uh, idea. That'll help people to, to grab onto your stories and understand them. Let me give you a quick example of this. This was research done out of Carnegie Mellon University. And at Carnegie Mellon University, they had you do a survey. Imagine you just did a survey, and then as compensation for the survey, you receive five crisp $1 bills. Now, admittedly, the survey had nothing to do with the actual study. They just wanted an excuse to give you the money. Then they dropped one of two pamphlets on your table and said, by the way, we're doing a fundraiser for Save the Children. Will you please give some of the money you just earned to Save the Children? You got to decide exactly how many of your $1 bills you would give. Pamphlet number one sounded something like this. All across Africa, there's problems with starvation. In Malawi, three million children are dying of starvation right now. In Kenya, there was a 42% reduction in maize production. As a result of that, 3 million people are now hungry. In Ethiopia, 11 million people are on the brink of starvation. How much money do you want to give to save the children? If you were anything like the actual participants in the study, you only wanted to donate a little over $1. Okay, now imagine you got this brochure instead. It said this. All of the money that you give to save the children will directly benefit Rokia. Rokia is a seven-year-old girl living in Mali. Rokia is facing hunger and starvation right now. But through your very generous donation, you can create a better life for her. All of the money given from you and others who support Save the Children will allow her to have food, education, and basic medical care. Now how much money do you want to give? If you were anything like the participants in the study, you more than doubled the amount you would give, almost $2.50 you were willing to give, simply because it was told from this perspective of one person. Interestingly, it doesn't have to be a real-life person. You can create fictional characters in your pitch. Here's Jane. Here's how she interacts with our product. Here's what happens. That can be equally as effective, and we'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about rousing the writer. But let's go to strategy number two now, which is building a mystery. I don't know about you, but I've sat through way too many terrible movies simply because I wanted to know what happens next. I'm like, oh, this movie sucks. Ah, I'm, I'm having a terrible time, but, but is she going to marry him at the end, or is she going to go back to the abusive boyfriend? And I end up losing an entire hour and a half of my life watching something that I totally regretted later on. Wouldn't you know, you can also do the same with your stories. You can create mysteries, intrigue, create a, a, a question, and not reveal the answer until the very end to get people curious about what's going on. Let me give you an example of this. This came from three different teams of scientists, uh, uh, astronomers, who wrote papers on, on the, the rings of Saturn. So I took this example, by the way, from Robert Cialdini, who is one of my favorite behavioral psychologists from Arizona State University. And he was reading through technical papers and trying to figure out why are some of them fascinating and others are boring is all living hell. And he found a commonality among all the fascinating papers. They all had a mystery of some sort. So here's the example from the astronomers. The rings of Saturn are one of the most unique astronomical formations in our galaxy. What are they made out of, though? Three different teams of scientists from three different universities came to three completely different conclusions. A team of scientists from MIT were convinced that the, that the rings of Saturn were made out of dust. A team of scientists from Caltech knew that they were made out of ice. And a team of scientists from Oxford were utterly convinced that they were electromagnetic particles. What did it turn out the rings of Saturn are made out of? 
And I just want to take a moment and just point something out before I reveal the answer. I'm noticing that virtually every single person in the room is looking at me right now, and many of you are even leaning forward with interest. And there hasn't been another point in the talk when I've seen this same phenomenon as what's going on right now. There's someone who's checking their notes, writing their notes, or someone who's looking at their phone. Right now, almost all of the eyes are on me, maybe literally all of the eyes are on me. Shows the power of mystery, right? So what are the rings of Saturn made out of? Dust! Just dust. Well, actually, ice-covered dust, which may explain why the scientists came to a difference of opinion in the first place. But here's the thing. You could have gone the rest of your life without knowing what the rings of Saturn were made out of, and it probably wouldn't have affected your existence. And I'm also reasonably confident that nobody in this room is fascinated by the concept of dust. And yet, the way the story was crafted, it got you interested. We start with a mystery. The rings of Saturn are one of the most unique astronomical formations in our galaxy. What are they made out of them? We then deepened the mystery. Three different teams of scientists from three different universities came to three completely different conclusions. Only after building up all this suspense was the answer finally revealed. Now, you might ask, when does it make sense to give the answer up front? When does it make sense to build suspense? And that's a judgment question. Sometimes it is better to give the answer right up front. We're going to decrease costs by 250%, because that can get a lot of attention. What? You can? How? You know? So you can get your attention just by giving it away. Even then, if I still wanted a little bit of mystery, I could still introduce it even at that point. I've told you what the bottom line is. I haven't necessarily told you how we get there. And so you can do a combination of both as well. It's not always either or, but sometimes it does benefit you to give away the punchline at the beginning, other times to hold it until the end. Let's go to strategy number three, which I call bring them on the journey. I read this from Paul Smith, who was the VP of diapers at Procter & Gamble, and he was presented with a mystery, and they were trying to figure out why is it that our diaper profits are going down ever since the 80s, going down, 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 year by year, year by year. What's going on here? What's happening? And so he did the research, and he found an, an undeniable conclusion. It was, it was unavoidable, it was clear, it was unambiguous. He figured it out, he's like, okay, this is it. He then came to the meeting with all of the shareholders and told them not what was going on, because he realized with this audience, they could figure it out themselves. And insights that people form on their own are far more memorable than those that are given to them. Insights that you discover on your own, you remember a lot better. And so he said, let's just take them on the journey with me. Let's figure out what will happen if we, if we allow them to discover this insight. So he put the data on the board behind him and said, here's what's going on. And again, clear trend. Ever since the, the 80s, profits were going down on diaper sales from Pampers. What was going on here? One person raised her hand and said, is that the year that Huggies entered the market? He said, good guess, but that was actually in the 70s. Another person raised their hand. Is that when supplies got more expensive? Another good guess, but that was actually just a few years previously. There's a little bit more thinking, and then one person said, wait a second. Was that the year that, that uh, the disposable diapers had full penetration on the market? Bingo! Yes, that's it! That's it! Turns out that up until that point, Pampers was making inroads on people using uh, uh, cloth diapers. And at, at, by the time the 80s rolled around, virtually every household was using disposable diapers. At that point, everybody in the room knew the difference between a developing market and a developed market, and he knew that they would come to the exact right conclusions. He didn't have to spoon-feed them to them on what to do. They would know to adjust their strategies towards a developed market instead of a developing one, and they did. So sometimes it can benefit you to think about, how can I make this a discovery for everybody, not just me? All right, let's quickly go over to the writer. Three very quick strategies for how you rouse the writer. Strategy number one is very simple, <laughs> literally. I want you to simplify your messaging when you are talking to your audience. Now, you might say, wait a second, isn't the writer highly logical? Yes, and? <laughs> 
it makes it harder for you to be logical if you use vocabulary that's harder for us to understand. So I'm going to ask you to simplify in three very specific ways. First with your words, second with your graphs, and finally with your numbers. When it comes to your words, please avoid those $64 words. Don't say ethnographic research. Say, we watch to see how people, what people would do. Don't say behavioral analysis. Say, we measured what would get people to download our app. The problem with $64 words is twofold. Number one is that if I have to stop in the middle of your presentation to think about the word instead of the message that you're delivering to me, you're distracting my writer from the actual message that you want to deliver. I'm like, oh, ethnographic research. I've encountered that word before. The other problem, though, is that we may have slightly different versions of the exact same word. Depending on where you went to school, what time you went to school, your career development since then, we may have very different definitions of even that exact same word of eth ethnographic research. So you can make it more precise with simpler language. Second thing you want to simplify are your graphics. So I know there are all these cool, you know, complex graphs that you can use nowadays, but honestly, for me to take in your message and understand it quickly, just go with what we learned in third grade. Pie charts, line graphs, bar graphs, really easy to take in, really easy to understand. Process what it is that you're trying to show me, and then get back to thinking about what's the conclusion you've reached and how best can we move forward with that conclusion. Finally, simplifying numbers. And I want you to use, it's another term I took from Chip and Dan Heath. It's called putting it on the human scale. Putting it on the human scale. Take numbers and put them on the human scale. Let me give you an example of this. I heard this one on the radio. Space is 60 miles away. OK, who cares? <laughs> it's not really relatable to me because it's not on the human scale. But you can make it relatable to me by putting it on something that I understand, that I encounter in my everyday life. Space is a lot closer than you might think. If we created a freeway between you and outer space, you would reach outer space in just one hour. Math checks out, right? You go 60 miles per hour on the freeway, space is only 60 miles away. So that's a lot more relatable. Steve Jobs had the MacBook Air, and he said, this is the thinnest MacBook on the market. It's only 0.2 millimeters thick, or whatever it was. I don't remember. The number truly is, is forgettable. What was memorable was when he took that thin MacBook Air, grabbed an inter-office envelope, and he slipped the laptop inside of the envelope. Whoa! That shows me how thin it is. I can fit it inside of one of those. I can't even fit all my documents in there. Like I've ripped so many envelopes trying to stuff fat documents in an envelope. But the, 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 the MacBook Air will fit there. Put it on the human scale. Makes numbers more relatable. All right, strategy number two, make it concrete. Let's go back to creating fictional characters. This one also comes from Procter and Gamble. They were trying to convince their stores about why they should appeal to the high potential buyer. This is an abstract concept. What the heck is an, a high potential buyer? As it turns out, about 80% of purchases come from only 20% of consumers. And they were trying to tell all of their stores, look, if you market to these high potential buyers, you will make so much more money. The stores didn't get it. They didn't understand it. They didn't adopt it. One day, Procter & Gamble hired a model, and they called her Lisa. And they said, this is Lisa. She's someone who comes into your store every single day. They then used their market analysis to arm the model with everything that she needed to know on how Lisa would behave. They then said, ask Lisa some questions. And they talked to a real life high potential buyer. And just having that, that person, just having someone who made it concrete, it made it a lot more understandable. Sure enough, the stores finally took the action, and they began marketing to the high potential buyer. Now, worth noting here, Lisa didn't exist. She was a fictional character driven by market research. But you can use your own data analysis to create characters in your stories. If you're giving a pitch on, on your startup idea for widgets, you can talk a little bit about how Lisa interacts with those widgets, or how Dave does, or whoever your, your target demographic is. Describe them. Describe what Dave is like, and then describe how Dave would use your technology. That makes it a lot more concrete and a lot more understandable to your audience. Finally, strategy number three for rousing the, the writer. And this is what I call framing loss. So I have two plans here. I'm just going to back up for one second. That was supposed to be an animated slide, but I think when we converted it to PDF, we lost the animations. So let me, uh, let me just give you this scenario right here. 
Imagine this, we are here on this beautiful University of Utah campus. Imagine that you are responsible for the healthcare system here and there is a problem and you need to make a very difficult decision because three units are on the brink of collapse. You're presented with two plans. So here's plan A. Plan A will, so will so that's a typo, will save one hospital unit and will save 2,000 jobs. Plan B, on the other hand, has a one-third chance of saving all three units and all 6,000 jobs. It has a two-thirds chance of saving no units and no jobs. Now, I know some of you are doing some of the math. It's EV neutral. <laughs> These are the same decision, so it doesn't matter either way. This is just a matter of personal preference. I want you to raise your hand. How many of you are for plan A? And I'm seeing most of the hands in the room. Plan B? Only a few hands here, and sure enough, this matched the actual research done uh, by, uh, um, gosh, I just, his name escaped me for just one moment, it'll come back to me in just one moment. He wrote, thinking fast and slow, Daniel Kahneman, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. This matched the actual research. If you were in the study, 80% of you agreed and wanted to do option A. You wanted to play it safe, you wanted to save guaranteed one unit in 2,000 jobs. Let me give you two new plans. Plan A loses two hospitals and 4,000 jobs. Plan B has a two-third chance of losing all the units and all 6,000 jobs, but has a one-third chance of losing no units and no jobs. These are the exact same plans. All I did was I changed it from a perspective of gain to a perspective of loss. But even though they're the exact same two plans, psychologically, they don't feel like it, right? In fact, if you receive these, 82% of you chose option B now. It was completely reversed. 80% in the first situation, 82% in the second situation. We're motivated to take risks when we feel there's something to lose. We're more motivated to pay attention to them when there's something at stake, when we're worried that we might lose something. But what if you have a legitimate growth opportunity? What if you really are talking about gains? There aren't losses here to be talked about. Let me turn now to Kenneth Fraser, the CEO of Merck, who's pictured in the middle there. And he had an ingenious way to motivate his team to try to figure out how to take risks. He started with a simple exercise. He said, I want you to think of all of the things that would put Merck out of business tomorrow. And they came up with all different reasons. You know, what if, uh, what if our projections were wrong? What if a competitor enters with this other drug? What if all of these things? And they came up with all these ways that the company might die. Then, after that, he asked, now, what can we do to prevent these things from happening? And they came up with ways in, to create risk opportunities that would prevent the company from failing. Now, interestingly, he just reframed growth opportunities as a way to avoid loss, but it motivated his team. They all suddenly were more motivated to take action. Suddenly, the risk wasn't in taking action. The risk was in not taking action. So if you can reframe even gains, instead of saying, we can create $600 million in revenue, you might lose out on a $600 million if we don't do this. Suddenly I'm reframing it as a loss and that's more motivational to people when it comes to change than framing it as a gain. All right, so we've talked about quite a lot in this, in this 45 minute session on how you energize the elephant and how you rouse the rider. So let me wrap up with just one last story that I think epitomizes both of these things. And this comes from Donald Berwick who was the president of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. He gave a speech in front of hospital administrators and said, we are going to do something, and here's what it is. We're gonna save 100,000 lives. Some is not a number. Soon is not a time. Here's the number, 100,000 lives. Here's the time, June 14th at 9 a.m. Notice how very concrete all of this. Notice how simple the language is, too, 100,000 lives. Very concrete, very simple, very easy to understand. But is your elephant sufficiently energized yet? So he had one last trick up his sleeve, and he brought a mother to the stage who lost her daughter as a result of medical error, and she spoke in front of everyone. And she said, I'm feeling a bit bittersweet right now. 
because I know that if you had done this before, you would have saved Josie's life. But I'm so grateful that you're going to do this moving forward because you need to do it, because you have to do it. Now, I don't know about you, but that just makes me feel misty-eyed just hearing this woman who lost her daughter to preventable medical error. He then, to get you motivated to know what to do, he gave six interventions that hospitals could do to prevent medical errors that result in loss of lives. And sure enough, on June 14th, when they reconvened at 9 a.m., they did not save 100,000 lives. They saved 122,000 lives. It's amazing how motivational it can be when you have the right story placed just at the right time. So with that, I'm going to let you, I can see people, I think we're probably setting up for the next thing, so I'm going to let you do the networking event. If you want to network with me, I'll be right here just for a little bit so we can talk, have questions if you have any. But I want you to think a little bit about the stories that you can tell in order to spread your message. And I thank you for your time.